I think what's beginning to happen now is we're beginning to see the issue engage a very wide variety of constituencies who are, who are getting the message that this is going to affect their future and their prospects. And so you're seeing an alertness and awareness as it was in health and security today. Uh, you're seeing alertness to the fact that this issue has really profound implications for what they do. And so they're now wanting to engage, wanting to get involved. Now, I think that has to go very much wider than health and uh, security communities. We need pretty well everybody is going to be affected. Part of my message to the conference today was that what makes climate change different from all the other problems that humanity has to deal with is that it literally affects the future and the livelihood of every single person on the planet. If we succeed in dealing with that problem, then their life chances improve. But if we fail to deal with that, that challenge, the life promises for everybody decline. I think that is different than anything else. You know, we deal with poverty or conflict or uh, ill health or bad education. Some of us suffer from those problems. A lot of other people actually are healthy, affluent, well-educated uh, and uh, very secure. This problem involves every single person. And so what you're seeing here is the beginning of the march of the climate issue out of, as it were, the sort of specialist uh, communities into the much broader community. What's interesting about the uh, particular nature of this conflict with both health and military, not obvious partners in things, actually one of the consequences of failure will be enormous pressure on the security community, the military, as conflicts arise around the world on all sorts of issues as a result of the stress imposed by climate change. And at a much more immediate and personal level, uh, the same stresses are going to increase the amount of pressure on people's health, whether it's through insecurity on food, uh, unavailability of water, or whether it's through uh, things like the spread of pathogens into uh, different, time, different uh, uh, temperature zones. All of these things are going to mean that both the health and the uh, military uh, worlds are going to be amongst the first responders to policy failure on climate change. If I look at where you might, you might anticipate kind of real pressure on conflict, two things cross my mind. One is the melting glaciers in the Himalayas. Uh, the Himalayas feed about six of the world's largest rivers. Uh, all of the, as it were, non-monsoon rain, uh, water in those areas comes uh, from those melting glaciers. All of the stuff that doesn't come during the monsoon period comes out of those glaciers. If those glaciers start to uh, uh, disappear, then it's going to put real pressure on all of those areas about how you share out the water resources available in those rivers. Well, we've seen lots of examples in uh, recent history of how conflict over managing river basins can become really uh, quite acute. And you're talking about China and India, both nuclear armed states, potentially in conflict over the management of the headwaters of, so of several of those biggest rivers. Another example which people don't notice very often is, is one of the consequences of rising sea temperatures is that fish species migrate. Well, if you remember, the only time NATO uh, countries ever went to conflict with each other was when Britain and Iceland conflicted over cod wars. Well, what you're going to see is migrating fishes, fish migrating out of their existing fishing grounds into other fishing grounds and a potential for real conflict as the fishermen try to follow the fish and then find themselves in other people's uh, uh, economic zones. I think both of those are areas where there's quite a high potential for conflict really in the next couple of decades. If I had to boil down to one single thing that we should do, then what we should do is we should tax carbon and we should recycle all of the proceeds of that tax into investment in low carbon technology. That way you would have a defensible, politically acceptable level of tax, you'd accelerate the rate of deployment of low carbon technologies. And as you drove carbon out of the economy, eventually that tax, of course, would disappear. So you would have a real way of controlling the current tendency in treasuries all over the world, which is to use 
uh, green taxes of one kind or another, not to actually change things in the environment because they don't through the price mechanism, but really to just increase revenues. And if countries were to be honest about green taxation by recycling the proceeds into green investment, then I think it would make a huge difference.